new episode from the New Lore Co. channel. Um, I'm streaming right now from my new home office in Arizona. So for anybody who hasn't been paying attention on my social media, I actually moved out here uh, last month in January. Um, I've been dating my boyfriend long distance for about a year and a half, and so it was time to um, move in together and see if we like each other 24-7. Um, and he had this beautiful house in Arizona already, and I can work from anywhere, I can run this business from anywhere, and so it just made sense. Um, and so here I am. Uh, as a self-described lizard person, I am suffering a little bit with how dry it is here, but um, I have humidifiers in every room, and I'm bringing in more and more house plants every day, so I think hopefully this will start to feel like a tiny slice of Miami in Arizona but no but it's been great um, and I'm hoping that now that I have the bigger home office which I don't know that you can perceive that necessarily on video just because of like the the lens length but um, um, it's much bigger than my home office this desk is actually in the middle of the room and and then it just keeps going that way so for me it's an enormous upgrade we can actually have like surfaces to, to photograph and and you know and film proper video more often and so I'm hoping that this new year brings a lot more YouTube videos, just a lot more stuff. Like I can actually, I have room to, to work and do more things that I was limited on in Miami. Um, so I'm excited. I'm looking forward to, to you know, just better, better workspace. And uh, so with that said, I have a topic for you guys today that is interesting. I don't hear about it very often. And you, nobody really talks about this in like sort of like the, tor the storytelling content strategy space, but I've been very seriously considering niching down um, to offer more work to this type of client because honestly, I enjoy it. I really enjoy it. I enjoy everything that I do for clients, but there's something more, a little more challenging about this angle that you just don't get when you work with a different, you know, with law or photography or uh, retail, you know, they, the challenges that these kind of clients face are a really interesting challenge for me to try to solve for them. And I think my background as a biologist helps me because oftentimes I find that there are, there are na narratives that are rooted in like a fundamental misunderstanding of what they do, what they offer, the environmental impact, the manufacturing, process, you know, whatever it is. And I, and I will go through examples so you know what I mean. But um, as a biologist who reads basically nothing but nonfiction, <laughs> with the exception of some Tolkien and stuff, um, I, I feel like I know quite a bit about a lot of industries and sort of what the truths are and what the, the misconceptions are. And so what I, what I want to talk about essentially when it comes to restorative narratives is I want to talk about the entire industries or sectors or businesses that have these bad narratives hanging like like a dead albatross across their neck and some of them are only partially true right there's oftentimes people will marry a truth to a lie right it's like yes yes they do this but oh my god they also do this right like they'll marry a truth with a lie. And so the, narr the negative narratives might only be partially true. They might be entirely false, like in their entirety. And how does this happen, right? Um, sometimes, it's, sometimes it's malicious. I will say I've had clients who, had, who, had, who were facing bad narratives against them that were not rooted in anything true, it was pure propaganda. Because, like it or not, the world we live in has, you know, sometimes you have adversaries and antagonists and some of those people want to see you out of business and so they're not above releasing a campaign that says the opposite of what you do or spins what you do in a negative light, etc. So that's one possible um, scenario that we face sometimes. Um, just public misconception is another one. They just don't understand or they take something that is true in one region of the world and then apply it everywhere across the board and then the entire industry is tainted even though that's not how the industry operates everywhere. So there's a lot of reasons for why negative stories happen 
But like I said, it's like when you have one anchored to you, it's an uphill battle because you have to fight that, right? It's not just good enough to tell good narratives like I've mentioned in other videos and you know on my socials, but it's imperative to fight bad ones just as just as passionately because if you let those sit there unaddressed, it leads it it lends them credence and credibility. And when you know what the negative stories are, you can either I don't want to use a spin because it, it sounds like we're making things up or, or we're, we're, we're spinning the truth and that's not what it is, but you want to, but you can flip it or come at it from an angle. It's like, yes, we know you believe this. This is why it's not true. Or look at all the ways that it's not true or that, you know, you can come at it from different angles and, um, and start replacing or start chipping away at what the negative story is and start replacing it with a good one, positive one, something that's true. And, um, and so with these industries, oftentimes it's like they do good work and they're capable of operating well and responsibly and sustainably, but you, but they have this uphill battle with like public, with PR, with reputation and a narrative. Um, and so how do we solve this? Right. And so when we, when, just to give you some examples of like who we're talking about, um, this is going to be incredibly unfair and I hope all my... <laughs> ex-colleagues forgive me but um i am i in a past life i used to do the marketing for um one of our big clients was a life insurance agency and i think it would be fair to say that um all the maybe not all let's be generous most of the negative perceptions around life insurance and life insurance businesses is probably well founded um, there's a reason that's a, that's a trope and it's probably true for a lot of people. There were excellent people selling life insurance, don't get me wrong, but there's a lot of really awful ones as well. And so that's an industry where I would not, I would never get involved with a life insurance agency or company again because I really, I'm not sure that they have a restorative narrative. I don't think that there's any way that we can flip unless I saw very, very concrete proof that how they are operating exceeds and excels way past like what the industry um, average seems to be. And you know that they've got policies in place to curb sort of like, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, well, not being too unkind. You know, just the sales tactics, the pressure, the coercion, you know, things that, things that make life insurance salesmen icky. Um, if I really saw that this industry or this one client was really operating very differently, then I would consider helping them. But as it stands, like, for example, that's a client that I probably would not help spin anything, right? There's no spinning. <laughs> there's, there's no spinning anything if it's just fundamentally not a good um, business model. But for example, I had a client in Central America and they were a big um, agricultural, agricultural client or producer of palms for palm oil. It's one of their major exports and products and everything. They make a lot of their own products to sell locally. And, uh, and I'm sure that when you hear palm oil, immediately you think of all the all the propaganda and i'm not necessarily using that in a negative word but um um all the propaganda you've ever heard about like the orangutans right you immediately you're like oh the orangutans of of borneo i think it is bad battle i was never a primatologist so you'll have to forgive me but uh right it's all the oh, all the poor orangutans the deforestation is decimating the creatures this is unsustainable agriculture, and you would be you would be right, but that's a case of where unethical uh, practices in one part of the world have sort of tainted the entire industry. And so, for this client in Central America, nothing could be further from the truth. Like they had their land, and something that most people don't know is that palm oil actually has the smallest square footage of any of the oils right? Smaller than canola, smaller than olive. And so it's the most efficient oil per square mile that you can grow, or square meter that you can grow, period. And with these guys, it's like they had their own farms. They're not deforesting um, new land. 
they had these extensive reforestation programs like in areas that they don't own or operate or grow in um, and their farms are you know sustainably sort of tended to and maintained and they have a ton of wildlife that calls their their plantations home for most of the year and um, and so they had obviously bad narratives to fight against and with them it was interesting because it's like they're not really like I said, it's like they're not really rooted in truth. And so for this client, you know, how do you go about solving this? Like, how do you go fighting a negative narrative like this? And so what we did is that we decided that because with them, these are just untrue things. They're just propaganda from, you know, unethical uh, farming in other areas of the world, or it's just preconceptions or, or just a little bit of misinformation that their strategy was going to be not just telling a new story, but being radically um, transparent and honest. And so that meant that for them, we actually set up channels on their website where they have 24 seven feeds of the plantation. You can actually log on at any time and essentially take a virtual tour through their plantations and see the little animals and see all the birds that call this plantation home and see all the little mammals scurrying around underfoot on the under the canopy and um, you can watch the um, what are they called um, there's a proper name for them but unfortunately I'm just gonna call them workers right now I don't remember um, and you can watch like the harvesting and how they go around like watering and you know so it's like it was radical transparency and then um, you know, you could, what else? I think they had access to a major river through their land, and so same thing, they were gonna make all these like, um, all these parts of their process available on their website, um, not just the standard routine sort of um, obligations that maybe the government makes you do, like water testing and soil testing, but they were gonna go above and beyond. They were gonna, get, they were gonna have a 3D map on their website showing you um, their reforestation projects, like how far they had come in the last 20 years of operating business. And so they were going to show all these things and the campaign was going to be just one of radical honesty. Be like, like we know what you think and we're going to actually show you what it's like. This is not, you know, we're going to, we're going to radically change what you think about this industry. And, and it wasn't so much I mean, obviously it was interesting for the public to have a different perception of this brand, but it was also important for their supplier, no, for their, um, their buyers, right? Because they sold wholesale to other brands that also use palm oil to make things and products and creams and, and whatever. And, um, and it was important for them too to be, to be comfortable knowing that their supplier of palm oil was just every bit as ethical as as they could be so that then they wouldn't themselves face any repercussions down the line if there were ever any allegations of, of whatever and um, and so that worked really well for this client we had another one um, who I'm trying to think now of like my best next example um, but we had another one. Oh, this is a good one. we had another client who was in packaging and this was also in Latin America, and um, and so they did a lot of like single-use products, right? Like for to-go things and whatever. Um, and so, of course, at, at first glance, you're going to be like, "That's terrible, right? That's an unethical business with unethical products, and we just we can't stand for it." And I would understand where you're coming from, except that in a lot of places, not just you know, not just Latin America, but everywhere really, there are entire businesses that would simply not exist without single use um, containers, whether those are paper, cardboard, plastic, whatever. Simply because like, think of like, if you've ever gone to Mexico or Guatemala on a vacation, and think of how many food vendors there are, right? And it's like, you can't get some street elote without having something to put it in. And do you want things that are potentially dirty or contaminated? 
you know, having single-use plastics not just enables people to have their own little independent businesses doing these kind of things, and gives them autonomy and, and financial freedom, but it ensures that people are, oops, sorry guys, that it ensures that people are stay safe, right? That you, they don't get dysentery, they're not getting uh, diseases from wherever. And um, so, um, and so we were there to help them, and it's like, of they're you know, of course they're telling us like, of course we want to go sustainable, and of course we want to replace everything with cheap um, uh, renewable resources or whatever. But a lot of these are expensive still. But they were exploring all sorts of um, alternatives. They were looking into sugarcane uh, waste, like all the fibrous uh, leftover waste, because that could be interesting. But then that brings in. See, so that sounds very sustainable. Well, they go, well, that's excellent. Because if you're producing a lot of sugar cane, you've got a lot of like the fiber left over, you can turn that into paper cups and cardboard containers and everything. But a lot of the farmers in these places use those sugar cane waste as energy, right? They'll burn that for energy. And so when you take that out of the cycle, now those farmers need to use a different energy source to power whatever it is that they need. And so these things are not as clean as they, or, or not as simple, I mean. They're not as simple as we would like them to be. It's not just, if you do the A plus B, you get clean energy, or you get clean resources. It's, life is so much more of a web. And so that's why it pays to pay attention sometimes to like, don't just buy everything you hear. There's usually a lot more to like, th the process. Um, and there's a reason why people aren't switching over yet. And, but anyway, but that was one alternative. Um, they were looking into avocado pits because those are all pure waste and really nobody's doing anything with like the pit. But it's like, well, if you grind them up, you end up with like a, a, a type of, I don't know if fiber is the right word, but a type of material where you can essentially make almost like a plastic-like substance. But again, it's pricey. Um, you know, so there's all these alternatives. Um, but some of them are going to take time to develop and the truth is that like unless you have something that is as good or better than an existing product and either the same price or cheaper people are not going to switch and it's and it induces hardship to force them to um and so for this company it's like we were never going to be able to counter all the negative perception of single-use containers at all or packaging but we could bring some light to it that it's not evil right there is a there is a purpose and it's like if you for example outlawed single-use containers tomorrow you would decimate what they call the informal economy of all these people who have independent little food stands or or make food out of their home kitchen and sell it to friends and neighbors and stuff like you would decimate that and then potentially create like a health hazard and so these things, they will happen. At some point, human innovation is gonna get us there where we can replace these things completely or replace them with a material that is cheap, accessible, renewable, clean to produce, easy to recycle, you know, whatever, whatever that ends up being. But for the meantime, it's like there's a time and a place for these products. And, um, and so what I like about these type of um, clients is that it just it becomes it's such a puzzle to try to figure out okay what the negative stories are obviously what the positive stories are how do you tackle what do you have to do to tackle sometimes it's using a good narrative effectively but sometimes it's also adding um not just like adding actions right um because if you're you're if you're your, your character, your brand is your values in action, right? It's like what actions will highlight what is true about who you are, your values, what you want to stand for, and then which ones won't. Um, another easy one, a slightly easier client that we had was a bank, and as I'm sure that you would agree, <laughs> most people aren't very fond of their banks, right? There's sort of an inherent dislike of your bank because everybody feels like they're getting cheated out of money, like these people are gonna make money by just taking yours. There's a whole thing, right? There, uh, an unpopular attitude around banks, and um, 
and with them, it's like we, you know, I sat down with the CEO and he like genuinely loves his people. He loves his country. He loves his countrymen. He loves the local um, artisanal products that his people can produce. Like he has an incredible amount of love for his country and his people. And, and that wasn't fake. Nothing about that was fake. But it's like you've been communicating from a place of would be the term it was it was from a place of like pretension because they were the number one bank in this area and so it's like nobody wants to hear how you're the number one maybe the number one bank right like that it was pretentious it was um tone deaf and it just wasn't it didn't align with who this man was and how he wanted to run this bank and um and so we switched the the communication completely completely we went in a much more ally type direction. And then we aligned the foundations because they're, the bank has foundations and it's the same problem. People assume that because you're a bank and you have a foundation that it's just a tax write off, right? So you're already fighting sort of a negative perception even when you are literally doing good. But that's not, um, you know, but that's, but that's to be expected. And so then we align the um, actions of the bank so that who they were serving, how they were serving, how they were going about it, how they were talking about it, was all way more rooted in um, like the CEO's like genuine love for people and genuine interest in people. And all the team was great too. Like there was nobody there who hated people. Like none of this was like, oh, you know, we just we know we clothe and feed children because you know tax write off. Like no, it was there was never anything like that. Um, you know, they had a genuine love of their country and the people, and they were like, well, we know that children, you know, most of the, a lot of the schools in the area are not up to par, which means that kids can't do their best in school. We're gonna, we're gonna take it upon ourselves to remodel schools. We know that a lot of kids, you know, they're not eating, and so they can't do well in school. We're gonna take it upon ourselves to feed them. You know, we know that our community build hand makes all these artisanal things that are exceptional and they deserve recognition and instead of getting um you know out competed by by chinese replicas we're going to invest in these markets and um add exposure and create uh, fairs and bring bring awareness and promote them and do all these things to try to build up your local economy because same thing, if you don't build up your local economy, who's banking with you? So obviously as a business, all these things have to help you somehow, but so many of them were also selfless. And, but, but in a way that like, if we, if we all get better, right? If we're all in a better place, then everyone does better. Not just us as a bank, but like you, because you're flourishing financially and you can actually afford to open a bank account or your kids are flourishing in school and they might actually have a chance to go to the university and then also have prosperous careers, right? So um, with them, we aligned everything that they do and it just, and it's gone way better for them. They've had a way more positive response now from audiences about who they are than back when they were trying to be just pretentious, like, oh, we're number one, bank with us because we're number one. And so, so those are three examples of how we tackle businesses that need restorative narratives. And, um, and so that's what I'm thinking. I'd like to know your thoughts in the comments, because um, I've been considering taking you, Laura, in a direction where we niche down into more of those types of industries, especially if they're like science adjacent, like, you know, and like in pharmacology, um, agriculture, that kind of thing, because I'm well-versed, um, energy, because I'm well-versed in those things as a biologist, and, um, and I think there's, a, it's really interesting, I really like, I really like learning about um, how much misconception there is a lot, about a lot of, um, a lot of industries and sectors, and I think some of them would be so easy, easy perhaps is a generous term, but but I, I can see a way to tackle some of these narratives and it's not going to be immediate. It's not going to be overnight. It might take six months to a year to build like a proper campaign <clears throat> to roll out and to start changing hearts and minds. But I think for so many of them it's possible, but they don't because they assume 
that if you just mention the good over and over and over, that's going to be enough, or they don't even know that some of these negative perceptions exist. This sometimes comes out just like in interviewing people. You get a sense of like, you didn't know how people felt, where they're like, yeah, yeah, we, we used to love this company, but they feel outdated or old, or we didn't even know they were still around, or you know, whatever. Like negative stories come out sometimes, and you're like, oh, that's an opportunity to tackle that. Um, and so anyway, so I hope you've learned something. I don't want to ramble on too much longer, um, but so that's a, sort of a peek into what restorative narratives are, um, how we have solved these for some clients in the past, and I would just like to know what you think because because um, I never want this to sound like spin. Like we're not in PR. We're not here to make something that is shitty seem not shitty. <laughs> Right? We're here to find latent stories that are true and um, build them up if they're positive and then tackle the negative ones in a, in a genuine way. Because like I, I, like I say, ad nauseum, it's like you must live your story and it must be true and livable. And so what I don't want to take is a client who is not actually the things that they say they are and try to fabricate that in the public eye because that's not what I do, that's not what I want to do um, and I don't think, you know, a crappy company deserves that. But there are a lot of companies that do well, they, they meet a need in this world and they are played down by negative stories and I think we can turn them around. So, that said, um, yeah, any thoughts or comments, leave them in the comments. Um, if I've earned a follow, I would love a subscribe for you to subscribe to the channel. Follow us on Instagram, LinkedIn, Threads. I think we're everywhere under New Lore Co. And, uh, and that's it. I will see you next time. Thank you so much.